Good afternoon, everyone. Premier has some remarks, and then you're going to hear from MLA Brian Jean, and then Mayor Melissa Blake, and then we'll open the floor to questions, uh, and as well go to the phone. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you again uh, for coming out today. Today I have an update uh, on the fire situation and some preliminary timelines for the voluntary re-entry of Fort McMurray and other communities that were evacuated due to the wildfire. So with respect to the fire update, there were 12 new fire wildfire starts in the last 24 hours. Currently there are 18 wildfires burning, three out of control, one being held, 12 under control, and two turned over to local authorities. Across the province, there are approximately 1,900 firefighters, 189 helicopters, 29 air tankers, and 426 pieces of heavy equipment. With respect to the Peace River fire, the fire is now around 20,000 hectares. We're working with BC on that one as the fire is on both sides of the border. With respect to the Greenview County fire, we've got a better handle on the size of the Greenview County fire that caused the evacuation of Little Smoky a couple of days ago. It's now estimated at 660 hectares, so a little smaller than we'd originally thought. The communities of Little Smoky and Fox Creek remained under a two-hour evacuation notice. But there was no growth in this fire yesterday, and it's now 80% contained. So we're hoping to have it fully contained today, so a bit of good news there. With respect to the Fort McMurray fire, the fire continues to burn out of control. Yesterday it grew towards Highway 63, north of Parsons Creek, but did not cross the highway. And we're not aware of any further damage to or loss of industry camps beyond Black Sands Lodge, reported loss to fire yesterday. This fire is now estimated to be more than 423,000 hectares. Weather today in the Wood Buffalo region is forecast to be 24 degrees with relative humidity of 30% and winds from the west gusting to a high of 20, mile, um, 20 kilomod, kilomod, kilom, kilometers per hour. <laughs> Cooler weather, however, as everybody is aware, is forecast for tomorrow and some precip precipitation is expected on Thursday and Friday. So, of course, we're all crossing our fingers that that happens. Now, as you know, soon after the evacuation of Fort McMurray and the other affected communities, five conditions were identified that must be met before the safe re-entry of residents can begin. Those conditions are, firstly, that wildfire is no longer an imminent threat. And to be clear, we add to that issue the issue of air quality. So as that too continues to be a significant threat to human health. At 8 a.m. on the Air Quality Health Index scale of 1 to 10, air quality in Fort McMurray this morning was 51. It has now fallen to 11, which is much lower, but still very high. Other conditions that must be met are that critical infrastructure is repaired to provide basic levels of service, and that essential services are restored also to a basic level. These include emergency services, fire, EMS, police, 911, open and safe transportation to and within the community, including traffic controls, access to emergency medical care and transport, access to potable water, electricity and gas, access to food, pharmaceuticals, banks and other essentials, and access to mental health supports. And we also need to ensure that hazardous areas are secure and that local government is reestablished. So the air quality issues we've had have set the recovery work back a bit, but progress is being made. 911 service has been restored. A retail reentry plan has been developed and will be executed once conditions allow. Hospital restoration has stalled with the poor air quality, but the mobile urgent care center is still operational. Electricity service has been restored to most and undamaged areas of the community, and this work continues. Work to restore natural gas service in Fort McMurray has been temporarily halted while an investigation is completed into the cause of an explosion in the Dickensfield area yesterday morning. And a note, there was one explosion, not two, as some outlets are reporting. I won't speculate on what caused that explosion, but it only makes sense to stop that work until the investigation is done. And to remember that many hazards remain in Fort McMurray. We need to address all of them before it is safe for residents to begin to return, and we are doing this. So while recovery work is proceeding, we continue to support the evacuees. 
As of 8 p.m. last night, 32,153 cards have been distributed to 66,767 people for a total distribution of $69.5 million. I'm told that attendance uh, was slow and steady with no lineups. Last night's telephone town hall had 10,511 participants. Another will be held this evening and we're expecting even more participation with the details of the re-entry that we're be, we'll be announcing today. So, with respect to the re-entry timelines, I can tell you today that if the five re-entry conditions are met, we anticipate that residents on a voluntary and phased basis will be allowed to begin to return to Fort McMurray beginning Wednesday, June 1st. With the return completed by Wednesday, June 15th, which will coincide with the hospital returning, we believe, to full operations. Now we know that people want to return home as soon as it is safe to do so, and that it, that is what we are working towards. If conditions change as they did just this week, the voluntary reentry may begin later than June 1st. Safety has been our first priority from the beginning of this situation, and it will continue to be our first priority. However, by June 1st, we expect the hospital to be able to offer primary care, public health, support for home care, some mental health supports, lab services, x-ray and CT imaging, pharmacy, and limited types of emergency surgery. Natural gas service is scheduled to be up and running by the same date. Electricity service have already been restored for undamaged homes. All areas are, are all roads are expected to be open and safe. Here's what won't be done by June 1st. The hospital will not be equipped to offer acute inpatient care, obstetrics, dialysis, inpatient psychiatry, and long-term care. Ground and air ambulance will be available to transport urgent cases to Edmonton if and when needed. In addition, a boil water advisory will be in effect. At this point, we anticipate the boil water advisory will be in effect until near the end of June. So let me be clear that this reentry plan is voluntary. It's a matter of allowing those people who wish to return on a voluntary basis to do so in a phased and cautious way. We anticipate that many people will not return as early as June 1st and we will support them in that decision. In particular, we will be directing that schools in the area that have been closed during the evacuation will not be conducting formal classes until September. Students will be advanced to the next grade. So let me tell you how the re-entry will work. We are planning for a phased re-entry of residents over the course of several days to allow for efficient traffic flow on Highway 63 and to ensure that limited services are not overwhelmed with the influx of people returning home. The re-entry schedule begins in the least damaged areas where the fewest supports will be needed by returning residents. So, June 1st, the Lower Town Site, Anzac, and First Nations communities. June 2nd, North Fort McMurray, which includes Timberley and Thickwood. June 3rd, South Fort McMurray, which includes Gregoire, Saline Creek, and June 4th, Abbasan, Beacon Hill, and Sapri Creek. Now, uh, before people uh, um, return to the community, there are some steps that they should consider taking. The Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo and the Provincial Operations Centre have prepared a detailed online mapping application, which we anticipate launching this afternoon. We encourage residents to check it to determine the status of their properties. This will be more detailed than the maps that are currently available and it will give residents a clear image of which homes have been lost and damaged. These images will be difficult to see for those of you who have lost their homes and quite frankly they'll be difficult to see for everybody from the community. And I encourage anyone who needs to to seek out the support they need including mental health supports available at reception centers or throughout the province by calling the Health Link toll-free line or the mental health hotline. Evacuees should call their insurance companies to determine what information the company requires about their property and any damage it may have sustained. And people should speak with their mortgage holder or lender about mortgage payment and, mortgage and payment options. The Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo is setting up information centres to provide a variety of services and information including mental health supports. 
So to be clear, again, the community that residents will be returning to will have basic services, but full services may not be fully restored immediately. So residents who choose to return should plan to bring the things they need with them, including refilled prescriptions, a supply of non-perishable food and drinking water for people and pets, as well as a cooler since fridges and freezers may not be usable. Long sleeve shirts, long pants, rubber boots, flashlights, batteries, a camera or video camera to document any damage to property for insurance purposes, hand soap or hand sanitizer that is at least 60% alcohol. I, re I reiterate that these timelines, and this is really important, are dependent upon the five conditions being met. And, and it's a balancing act. I mean, we, we don't want to, to have people completely commit to a certain date, but at the same time, we've been hearing more and more that people need to hear, have some idea of the dates that they're dealing with. And so we hope we've achieved that balance uh, through what we're announcing today. Some of the factors that will allow uh, the reentry to occur, even the reentry to basic services that we're talking about today, uh, are based on criteria that are beyond human control, like, for instance, the air quality. Um, but, as I said before, it's important to give people some timelines, however tentative, so they can begin to make plans. Whether this means enrolling your kids in school in the community that you've evacuated to, or seeking temporary rental accommodations because it will be least, at least a couple of weeks until you can return home. Now some people, and this is really important too, should not plan to return to Fort McMurray right away, including those who have breathing difficulties, those who are in the later stages of pregnancy or with high-risk pregnancy, and those who are receiving cancer treatment, dialysis, or other specialized medical services. We also know that some people who want to return to the community have no homes to return to. Now, our government will help ensure that Fort McMurray families have a stable place to live until they can return home. Eligible evacuees without sufficient insurance to pay for a temporary place to live and who cannot stay with family or friends can be assured that the government will help them with housing supports. The Wildfire Evacuation Transitional Accommodation Benefit, which our Cabinet agreed to today, will cover costs for eligible evacuees' damage deposit, rent and utility connections for up to 90 days from the date of evacuation, should you be eligible. This benefit supports their housing needs until longer term or permanent housing solutions are in place. The benefit may also apply to hotel room costs while evacuees are arranging for temporary housing. Albertans may apply for the benefit in person at any Alberta's Works office. So, in conclusion, as always, Chad and Scott are here to take questions, uh, as is Minister Larrabee. Um, but um, I, we have a couple of other here. Uh, people that have some comments to make. So I'll now ask my colleague Brian Jean, the leader of the official opposition and of course MLA for Fort McMurray Conklin to speak. One of my priorities has been to ensure that he has the information he needs about the fire control and recovery efforts to support his constituents and I'm glad that he's able to be here uh, with us today. So take it away Brian. Thank you Premier and she has done a great job in keeping me informed and making sure that I can keep my constituents informed and I truly appreciate that and I appreciate the government for doing that. Good afternoon. It's with a great sense of relief that we are hearing today of a timeline for re-entry for my citizens. It's important as the people of Fort McMurray look to rebuild that they have an opportunity to move forward as quickly as possible on that process both me mentally and physically. Traveling the province, talking to evacuees, and seeing the devastation of the fires rising around our city firsthand just two weeks ago, I know and understand that people of Fort McMurray, my citizens, my family, my friends, are going through a lot of anxiety, a lot of grief, anguish, and many other feelings. I know every morning that I've been receiving messages from my family, my friends, and my neighbors. They are tired stressed and waiting to hear this news and I thank the Premier for it. They continue to watch as the mountains of smoke engulf our community and I can imagine the sense of frustration and anxiety they go through. For families, they will see their memories lost, they will see their lives changed, they will not see many of their photos or other things that they remember. 
But we have seen the photos of our neighborhoods in ashes, and I hope today will help all of us take a step back towards normalcy and recognize that we can move forward to a better life and to have our beautiful city back again. I do want to thank the Premier and the Minister for consulting with us, not just today, but during this entire crisis, and especially about the plans for re-entry so we can communicate that back to our citizens immediately. I'm sure that no one's going to be surprised that I have been both privately and publicly uh, pushing the Premier and her Cabinet for a date, but I will emphasize, along with officials today, that safety, the safety of my residents, is our ultimate primary concern, and safety is the number one concern going forward. As I've said, stuff can be replaced, but people's lives, the lives of my citizens, cannot be. I understand these dates remain contingent on several safety benchmarks, and I'm glad to hear that because those safety benchmarks need to be met before my citizens should go back in to face any dangers. For all Albertans concerned, I ask for your prayers. Prayers for the safety of our citizens, prayers for rain, and prayers for the safety of our emergency personnel, those men and women on the ground that are fighting to save our property. Let's never forget that they're putting their lives on the line for us, and nothing is more important than their safety. I want to say to the people of Fort McMurray that myself and MLA Tani Yao have your back. We won't stop advocating for you, fighting for your priorities, making sure that Albertans feel they have us at their backs every day. We will continue to ask the questions, the tough questions, and the Premier, I'm sure, will continue to answer, and we look forward to that. I am fiercely proud of our city, fiercely proud of Albertans. I'm fiercely proud of the work we do the men and women that work in our community. We will rebuild our city better than it's ever been before. And I will stand beside you. Every step of the way. We will rebuild our city. And it will be better than ever. I will have my tool belt on and my shovel in my hand. And we will clean it up and rebuild it. Before we end today, I want to again thank the Premier her cabinet, Melissa Blake, her council, all of them for their work together to make our citizens have a better quality of life, understand through communication and through other mechanisms that they will be back in and that we will have a city that's more beautiful and better than ever before. Thank you very much. Um. So before uh, I open the floor, of course, I'd like to acknowledge the very hard work of the Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo. They have, of course, been faced with an, an unimaginable task, uh, one that is unprecedented, I believe, for municipal leaders across the country. And they've been working under very difficult circumstances for several weeks now. The re-entry timelines that we're working on are very ambitious, and that's a credit to the hard work of Mayor Blake, her council, and the many, many people uh, who uh, work for them. And so with that, I'd ask uh, uh, Mayor Melissa Blake to make a few comments. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Madam Premier, Minister Larvey, my dear friend and uh, representative Brian Jean, all the citizens of Wood Buffalo, this is a wonderful uh, piece of news for us today. It is amongst many other pieces of news that we receive, of course, and the paramount importance of what we're doing is establishing an opportunity for our citizens to understand what I've long known, that we do have a home to go back to, and what I believe truly is not unlike what you heard from Brian, that we will rebuild and that we will be better at the other end of this long journey that we'll be a part of. The journey is long, but it's just become a little bit shorter in our minds about how that might be possible. I think we've had an incredible working relationship that has unfolded between the Government of Alberta, the uh, partners that we have in our Regional Emergency Operations Centre, uh, the Council that I serve with, and the ability for us to finally, and at this uh, point, put something forward for our public to be able to contemplate how our lives now fit into that scenario. As unique as our citizens, as, as unique as the, the Council views and the folks that we speak to, and everybody will be making their own choices. So I tip my hat to the province for making this something that is flexible, for being forthcoming with the information about if you go early, you're going to have a very different community than you had when you left it. If you wait a little bit longer, all of the efforts that are going into making it the same type of community to go back to will be much further advanced. Um, I want to share with my citizens that um, we do, we really do have a fantastic community to return to, but I 
beg you not to put yourself in any kind of risk or peril, uh, to think about, again, what you're returning to as not being what you've seen before, but to envision and, and imagine with me what we will be a year from now, five years from now, and ten years from now, because that's the journey that Council will be on now that we've got an idea of where we'll be going back, how do we put the next steps in place. So later today we'll have a Council meeting. We're trying to get our government back into normalcy and in the phasing of events. One of the things we needed was a government that was uh, functioning and I trust that we're already well on that path. I also trust that the first responders are still our very critical interface with this thing that is still not where we need it to be from that safety perspective. And to each of those first line responders and behind the lines folks, you will again and forever have the appreciation of the residents of Wood Buffalo for the efforts that you've put in to making this day and the future days ahead even possible. To my municipal staff, I need to send a message as well. Uh, you are just like us. You are citizens. You're displaced. You have homes lost. You have things that you still retain and you're there on the ground and you're doing your best and I want to thank you for the efforts that you're putting in and encouraging you as well to keep this vision of where we'll be short time from now and know that you've got again the appreciation of my council and of the citizens for the work that you've conducted to make our citizens uh, fully capable of being able to return to the community that they're so very proud of. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the news today and again we share the perspective that nobody comes home until it's safe to do so. Thank you. And we will now open the floor to questions. Will there, sorry, Premier, will there be guided tours or are we relying strictly on the app to, for people to be able to go in and see what they're the uh, the tour pro the the sort of visit to neighborhoods uh, particularly Beacon Hills Abbasand waterways that will be part of the reentry process. So in the schedule that I outlined, they are sort of the last communities that uh, that people will be reentering. And of course, many of the people there, it's just a question of the tours. Uh, it's not a question of actually, you know, going they, back to their so home. Will it be set up tours or will it be just driving through on their own? Um, I think we'll we'll uh, work out the details of that piece of it um, with with officials uh, before we get there. But the point is, is there won't be guided tours before uh, the the reentry date that we identified the first the earliest one. Will workers be returning to those camps north of Fort Mac before June first? Um, well, many of them are still there. Uh, we need to understand that, that uh, several of the camps um, north, of, particularly those that are north of Suncor and Sincrude, are in, in separate areas dealing with separate hazards and separate issues that have to be evaluated. So that is delinked, and I would suggest, or decoupled from this particular announcement and this process. Um, and it's ultimately, though, driven by the same factors. Uh, do they have, uh, is it safe? Is it safe from a fire perspective? Is it safe from an air quality perspective? Is it safe from a, a essential supports perspective? And uh, and those decisions are made uh, individually and differently um, for those communities. Premier, you said that the uh, return to Thickwood and Timberley will be one of the earliest on June 2nd, I believe you said for that mm -hmm. one. Uh, but there is one area of Timberley in particular that is quite destroyed, honestly, Prospect Drive. Will that area yes. be on a later date than the rest of Timberley? Um, I think the expectation is that um, people would, I mean, there'll be fences up around that area right. at that point. I think people would be able to go and, and, and look at them at that time if they chose to. But obviously, uh, there would also be the issue of where, where they would find accommodation because obviously they're not going to be able to there. And so that's the work that will be going on through the uh, regional municipality of Wood Buffalo to look at um, alternative accommodations for people who return who don't have spots there. So uh, on the edge of the destruction, though, maybe maybe Scott can answer this better. Uh, like, with there's some houses right on the edge of the destruction, will those people be able to return on June second? Scott Long, Executive Director, Operations, uh, Alberta Emergency Management Agency. We're still working through a lot of the detail with the Regional Emergency Operations Center. Um, the the key the key aspects right now are we, we do have a timeline which is conditions based. Uh, it's going to be by welcoming by neighborhood, uh, and my understanding is is that those houses, those residents that have been severely damaged, will be fenced off. Uh, and if there is any tours, it would be done with under escort to make sure again safety drives everything. Uh, but clearly, uh, and it's come through loud and clear in all the town halls, people want to make sure they can see the residents uh, damaged or not and if they're strong boxes or valuables there th they have that opportunity and I know the Regional Emergency Operations Center has is, is definitely factored that into the plan. Those details will be forthcoming. Thanks. Hey, 
yesterday that there are some essential services people that are still working in some facilities in the north area. Um, what are those people doing there? What's the point of leaving those people um, so I'm sorry, are you talking about the camps or are you talking about within the city? Uh, no, the camps. Um, uh, like, like Suncorn and Syncrude, you said there were about 100 people that are still there? Uh, well, it, I mean, they're, what they're doing is, is so they're, with respect to the uh, the actual uh, in, uh, plants in, in Syncrude and Suncorp, they're, they're basically uh, uh, ensuring that they're there to fight the fire should it become necessary. They're there to ensure that shutdown procedures are, are going going ahead appropriately. Um, I haven't had an update on, the, on how many people are in each of those sites uh, today. Uh, Chad will be able to tell you uh, in more detail, but generally speaking, the, the threat ha to each of those sites has diminished slightly, uh, although it continues to be under threat, but, but they are slightly more optimistic this day that they've been successful in holding the fire uh, with respect to both of those sites, and, uh, and so they're, they're optimistic about their ability to get through this day. And then with the weather change uh, coming later today, uh, the, the, the trend should reverse quite significantly. So are they shutting down or are they restarting? I don't believe they're restarting right now, no. <laughs> Premier, I spoke to an evacuee uh, this morning uh, who was uh, evacuated a second time. He went mm -hmm. up to back to work on Monday. I uh, was only there for a couple of nights and then back out again because of the threat of the fire. Mm -hmm. uh, given that, given that it's such a volatile situation like that, how confident are you with this June 1st uh, reentry? It's a really good question. I mean, now the person that you're describing would probably not have been evacuated uh, from the camp because the camps weren't actually evacuated the first time. Uh, they actually received the evacuees and as I've said before, we thank them for that. Uh, but there were so, would certainly have been people that were in those camps who are also residents of Fort McMurray who would have left and then gone back up to the camp and then had to leave again. The issue there is just that we're talking about two different locales, two different assessments of safety. Um, we, we don't know for sure. But based on the tremendously good advice and the best guess of the officials we're working with, you know, we have uh, Scott and Chad here. They are supported by about 120 people in this building who are working collaboratively with about another 120 people at the REAC in Fort McMurray, along with all the for first responders. And as every day goes past, we get a more and more detailed assessment of the state of play, both in, in the city as well as around the city as far as the state of the wildfire goes. And of course, as you've heard them say, the more it actually burns, the more protected the city becomes because there's less fuel. And so on their best guess, they think we're at a point of being able to put out these dates and be reasonably close to them so that the certainty that people also need in order to help them uh, deal with the tragedy that they've been through can also be provided. So it's a judgment call, but uh, we, we are making our decisions based on the best advice of the most informed and dedicated officials uh, that I think are probably anywhere in the country. Premier, uh, most of those rebuilt or re reentry processes are currently stalled. Just you know, the natural gas, the people cleaning up the hospitals. How many days do you need before the June first reentry just to get everything working? Uh, well, the June first uh, re. I mean, we. The, it varies depending on, e on, each, uh, on each level. I, I think we were well ahead of schedule with respect to the gas, for instance. We're well ahead uh, of schedule with respect to the electricity. Um, we've given ourselves more time with respect to the hospital because of the delay. Um, and uh, so we, we're fairly confident that, that that June 1st date can be met to meet that mid-level uh, level of health care, notwithstanding the delays that you know we saw yesterday and that are still in place today and may continue until the air quality improves a bit. And the store owners, how many days are you figuring they're going to have to, to get I think they were also fairly well ahead of schedule um, as well. So that's uh, been another optimistic thing. They too have slowed down their work right now and many of them have, have not come up er, because of the air quality. But uh, we've had pretty positive reports back in terms of the rate at which they uh, are able to get um, get those essential retail services up because it's really important that the essential retail is in place before people uh, begin to return to the city. We're going to go to the phone lines now. Operator, please put through the first caller. Your first question comes from Chris Havarko with the call Calgary Herald. Your line is now open. Hi, I have a question for Chad, just following up on something the Premier said. Uh, Chad, can you give us sort of your, uh, your best assessment on the threat right now to the oil sands operations? The, uh, the work camps and the sawmill that are north of Fort McMurray? 
Yeah, sure, I can. Uh, Chad Morrison with Alberta Wildfire. So uh, currently we continue to hold that uh, western excursion we had the other day west of Highway 63. Um, we're holding it currently away from the Northlands Mill site. We're working with that uh, company uh, to continue to um, support them and, and their and their preparations. Uh, so we've had no impact there. Um, the fire has burned around some of the vegetation areas around the uh, oil sands facilities, as expected. Um, and then uh, today we expect lighter lighter winds and continued uh, humidities to rise as we start to see some potential, uh, you know, potential for rain or at least cooler weather in the next couple of days, which will be a real uh, bonus for us. Um, as well, around the city, uh, you know, we've been able to, uh, as expected, hold that hold the fire away from there and actually has created a better guard for us. So we have firefighters in the community. Uh, continue to deal with hot spots and make good progress. Uh, we held that fire line uh, yesterday, which was a real positive for us in many of the areas. Um, and then as well with the cooler conditions, we're also expecting to feel uh, more confident that the, the areas around the, the city will be continue, continue to be more secured. So um, in terms of the uh, industrial camps and facilities out there, uh, we've been able to hold the uh, line around the Neralta Lodge and, and many of the other industrial camps uh, since, since yesterday's uh, run. And we feel uh, uh, fairly confident in the days coming ahead if we see some rain that will continue to uh, you know have established a uh, fire guard and, and burnt area there that will make those uh, areas more safe so we're there to support uh, not only the community and the municipality but as well the the industry partners as well we're working closely with them to ensure that the oil and gas uh, and oil sands facilities are protected so we're there uh, making sure that we do that as well okay just to follow up yesterday you obviously lost the uh, the one lodge and I'm wondering how close were you to losing more camps uh, the sawmill or any of the oil sand facilities yesterday and last night and this morning. Sure, I can speak to that. Uh, you know, it was unfortunate, uh, very unfortunate that we uh, lost uh, the, the one uh, lodge, uh, and that's obviously due to the extreme fire behavior. But I really do have to give credit to the firefighters that were out there that were able to protect it and hold the line on those other ones, uh, uh, Noralta especially, uh, currently, and just holding the fire back uh, where it's at currently. I mean, we still have to get through today. Uh, we still have some burning conditions out there, So, I'm, but I'm optimistic as uh, the day turns and, and we get some cooler weather the next two days, we'll continue to hold it. In terms of the oil sands facilities, uh, uh, again, uh, our firefighters are there supporting supporting them and the efforts trying to hold that away from the facilities. We were very successful in some of the areas there to the north, and so the fire hasn't encroached as far as we, uh, we had uh, first feared. Uh, and so, but there is it has burned up around the edges and the vegetation as expected. And then we continue to work on putting them out and support the the and oil and gas facilities to do that. We have a number of callers on the phone, so I'll stay with the phone for a few more questions, then I'll come back to Keith. Operator, please put through the next caller. Your next question comes from Nia Williams with Reuters. Your line is now open. Hi, can you talk a bit about what exactly the industrial firefighters on the oil sand sites are doing and um, what steps they've been taking to protect the facilities and how big a challenge this is for them compared to, say, previous fires in, the, in Western Canada in the past? Uh, a good question. Um, uh, the, uh, on, on Syncrude, there are 78 uh, personnel, and in Suncor, they have, I believe, 10 personnel. Most of these folks are uh, um, industrial uh, specialist uh, firefighters. They've got uh, foaming trucks, uh, et cetera. Uh, right now, um, uh, with, with the uh, industrial firefighters, they've also got some essential personnel just to make sure that the systems are, are, are maintained as well. Uh, they're working in close conjunction and collaboration with uh, wild firefighters, and I can tell you as well with structural uh, firefighters. So some of the structural firefighters from uh, the community of Fort Mac were actually uh, forward in the area, I believe, in Naranta Lodge with some sprinkler kits. Uh, so right now, um, uh, the uh, industrial firefighters are holding back with their specialist gear, and if 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 needed, if uh, required, uh, they will engage that. Uh, 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 that uh, the use of that uh, specialist equipment, uh, but right now, as uh, as uh, Chad has said, uh, the wildfire fighters are, are holding the line, and uh, the remediation, or not the remediation, but the get mitigation measures that industry have done in their own emergency management plans, uh, it is uh, they've got quite the um, uh, perimeter, uh, a clear cut there, so there's not a whole lot of fuel uh, anywhere near those facilities. Thank you. And, and can you talk a bit about how this compares to, to other fires that have threatened industrial facilities in the past? Is this much bigger and much closer than any others? Yeah, Chad Morrison with Alberta Wildfire again. So in 2011, we had similar fire up to the north uh, facilities here, a very large, uh, similar spring fire called the Richardson Fire. Again, it challenged uh, 
uh, the facilities there as well, and, and uh, but it burned up to the edges, and we're able to work with obviously our industrial partners to continue to hold those fires away. Um, again, uh, with cleared sites free of clear vegetation and trees, um, they're very resilient to wildfire. Uh, we can continue to put the fire out, and it burns to the edge, and then we were able to put it out and contain it. So, uh, long term, uh, once those areas are burnt out, the, the fire and the facilities will actually be safer uh, from any future impacts. Operator, please put through the next caller. Your next question comes from Brianna Carson Smith with, with CTV Edmonton. Your line is now open. Hi, Premier. I'm just wondering um, what does the air quality need to be at and for how long before residents are allowed back in? Well, generally speaking, that's actually a really good question. Uh, generally speaking, we look at the scale from 1 to 10, um, and uh, and we will certainly be advising people uh, where it's beyond that. And, and of course, in anyone that's in there now, we're looking at them having the appropriate masks and ensuring that everyone has the appropriate masks. So I think we'd be looking at it being below 10. And then, of course, as we've said, because it kind of flares up and, and, and flares back, uh, depending on where the fire is, we're also going to be suggesting that that people with uh, breathing difficulties not be part of the group uh, that considers coming back earlier, uh, you know, with the June 1st date. Uh, and uh, so we'll keep a close eye on that. Uh, Alberta Health Services reporting on that uh, daily. And, of course, we're monitoring daily uh, through Environment to Alberta as well. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's like with, with many jurisdictions, you need to uh, be conscious of your health uh, first safety continues to be the priority. Sorry, and does this mean as well that the mandatory evacuation, evacuation is going to be lifted on June 1st and how many people are you expecting to return? Well, uh, as I said, what we're suggesting on, on June 1st is we are on a phased basis. So if you don't live in the downtown core um, or, or the First Nations or ANZAC, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, you're still the subject of a mandatory evacuation on June 1st. Should that date hold? Because that's the other issue. This is our best guess. Um, it's still subject to all the conditions, the five conditions we laid out, and the issue of safety. Um, but uh, as of June 1st, uh, should you reside, uh, your, your regular residence be in the, in the uh, lower town site in Anzac, in the First, the First Nations, uh, then you would be uh, allowed to come back in uh, with an understanding that you are coming back to a, a community that has basic services, not complete services. Operator, please put through the next caller. Your next question comes from Jason Markusoff with McLean's. June 1st, uh, sorry, June 1st sounds like a fairly uh, round date. Could you explain why it would be June 1st and not, say, um, next Wednesday? And also, and this may be a question for Scott Long, um, not that I think it should be this way, but the evacuation, the entries for Slave Lake and uh, High River, Alberta, during the flood and the fire, were, uh, were about half, of, half or less of this. Can you explain why this one was so much longer? Well, let me just begin, and then I'll pass it on to Scott if he wants to offer anything more. But uh, let me begin that, that essentially that date comes as a result of, of uh, Alberta Emergency Management Agency uh, con uh, consolidating all the information they have from the representatives in the POC that are dealing with all the different uh, elements that inform each of those five conditions, along with the, uh, the recommendations and the very important work being done at the regional um, uh, uh, operation center at the REOC down uh, on the ground in Fort McMurray. So they come together, they assess the damage, they assess uh, the issues that need to be addressed, they do their best guesstimate in terms of when they can be addressed, and they're all linked up to those five conditions. So uh, with that, uh, they, they gave us some dates and then we sort of, we push it out a little bit to allow for a bit of um, flexibility should things slow down, as they did, for instance, in the last couple of days. Um, but it is all essentially driven by the best best advice of officials. And uh, I know Scott will want to talk about the re-entry time, but I will point out the fact that, for instance, in Slave Lake, we got out of phase one uh, fire control with Slave Lake at day one. Um, and so then the re-entry happened roughly 14 or, you know, 13 days later, as opposed to Fort McMurray, where quite yesterday, quite clearly yesterday, we were back in fire control of, you know, uh, the, the city is threatened by fire, stage one. So uh, I think in terms of counting re-entry days, it's important to understand 
that you look at the right start date. But I'll certainly allow Scott to provide additional information if you'd like. Yeah. Thank you, Premier. Uh, the other thing I will mention is that uh, we have a plans team in the uh, Regional Emergency Operations Center uh, composed of uh, uh, industry, uh, ACO representatives, uh, municipality. Uh, that same sort of uh, plans team is resident here in the Provincial Operations Center. Uh, it's a very collaborative effort. Uh, we are feeding in and we are taking our cues from the municipality, the people that are on the ground who are in the best position to judge uh, the uh, the the, the uh, conditions-based criteria for entry. Uh, that is really what's driving a lot of the timeline. It has been carefully assessed. Uh, and um, the, the biggest concerns, I think the Premier has already mentioned, one of them is the hospital to make sure that is up, uh, running, and as functional as possible. Uh, and so that's, that's part of the, the, the planning process. Uh, it's been a, a long time. Uh, we've been at it now for certainly since the incident happened, parallel planning. Uh, to make sure that, again, everything uh, that drives those re-entry conditions is based on safety. If it's not safe to go back, uh, then we certainly will advise and, 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 and people will not go back until those conditions are, are, are satisfied. Operator, please put through the next caller. Chester Dawson with the Wall Street Journal. The line is now open. Yes, thank you. I have a couple questions. First, I just want to clarify, it sounds like based on the the... the Square footage that the fire has actually grown in the past day, but it's just growing in areas away from the, the, you know, the population centers and the oil sands, if you could clarify that. And secondly, um, in terms of the economic impact, um, is, is the evacuation order lifted or will it be as of June 1st for the oil sands facilities north of Fort McMurray? And how soon would you expect uh, those facilities to restart and, and people to get back to work? Uh, it's Chad Morrison with Alberta Wildfire for your first question. Yes, uh, as the information and intelligence flows in, we get the updated size, but for the most part, yes, it has burning in the forested areas away from the communities and the oil sands facilities. Obviously, uh, the last day or two, there has been some uh, burning around there, uh, so that's been in it, but note the size is um, primarily out in that uh, forested area. Uh, in, in terms of your second uh, uh, question, and I'll certainly allow Scott to uh, elaborate, but as we've said before, this uh, today what we're talking about is Fort McMurray, and and each of the uh, uh, each of the facilities that we talk about with respect to the oil sands. Uh, have uh, their own plans, their own assessment of safety, and their own their their own emergency response and recovery plans. So uh, honestly, it, it depends to some extent where they are ge uh, geographically, um, as well as uh, what the state of their operations are. There are a number of of, of uh, uh, producers that are still producing right now, um, and so that needs to be kept in mind. What we've talked about thus far is CNRL uh, or not CNRL, sorry. Suncor and Syncrude. Uh, CNRL, for instance, has continued to produce uh, almost without interruption, and I believe that Shell has as well. So it's really a facility-by-facility facility assessment. It's really based on their particular safety uh, issues and their assessments and their relationship to the fire. The previous um, uh, stop in operations that we saw at the beginning of the fire was more related to their uh, the um, access to um, their workforce, uh, because so many of them, of course, were resided in, in Fort McMurray. Uh, and now they will engage in the same kind of responsible safety assessment uh, that uh, we've seen occur with the, the town, and it will depend on a site-by-site -site basis. But certainly um, I'm not happy to have Scott add anything to that. Does that pretty, okay, that pretty much covers it, I'm told, so. Operator, please put through the next caller. Rebecca Penty with Bloomberg News. Your line is now open. Thanks very much for taking my question. Just building off that last um, comment you made about uh, the oil sands restarts, Premier, I'm wondering if you can offer any thoughts on um, the discussions that are going on about the workforce and and accessing workers. What is the province thinking um, in connection with the companies on bringing workers in? Is Are, are we going to see more of a fly-in, fly-out uh, workforce? Is there a discussion around setting up any kind of um, mobile homes or, or um, um, modular homes in Fort McMurray so people can get back to work uh, in terms of families. I'm just wondering if you can comment on any of that. 
Well, I think there's a lot of uh, different issues that you, you um, intersect with in that question. I think that, first of all, uh, for the companies, generally speaking, we've been working very closely with them to support them in their efforts and vice versa, as we've talked about a number of times already uh, throughout since, since day one of this crisis. Um, I think that uh, each company is going to come uh, uh, is going to come up with their own plan. It needs to be understood that in almost all cases, most of the camps are secure at this point. Uh, some ha are not, but but um, uh, some many many are, um, and so we'll be working uh, with them to look at the the inventory to determine whether or not that inventory can actually be addressed uh, through their own resources. Uh, with respect to the issues of of people um, re-entering Fort McMurray, it'll be handled the way it is with respect to all of Fort McMurray and the re-entry of Fort McMurray. Um, and we'll be looking at, at, first of all, of course, of housing those residents from Fort McMurray first. Uh, but um, we'll uh, be moving forward and, and looking at what the additional housing needs are of the camps. But because of the, the economic slowdown, the fact of the matter is, is that not all of those camps had been fully utilized before the fire began. And uh, so we'll wait to hear from the um, the producers whether they have a shortage of camp inventory overall. Um, but that's separate from the re-entry process for Fort McMurray. And uh, and I think the issue of assessing additional housing for uh, Fort McMurray workers uh, in, or sorry, uh, oil sands workers who might reside in, in Fort McMurray is something that would be done once we've uh, focused on reestablishing the residents of Fort McMurray uh, who were residents prior to, many of whom do work in the oil sands, but not all of whom, of course. So um, a little bit uh, different cross purposes there, but we are working collaboratively and we'll make sure that uh, the needs of the residents are met and that we're able to support the work of the, uh, of the um, producers in and around the area. Thank you. Come back to the floor now. We have time for one last question. Go ahead, Keith. Uh, one of the things we've seen from past experiences where people have had to leave their homes for a long period of time is they come back to a mess in their fridges and freezers mm -hmm. to the point they may have to throw out the fridges mm -hmm. and freezers. Is there a plan to deal with that? There absolutely is. There's a brilliantly detailed plan, uh, which we have not Re released every page of it, but indeed, that's there's a full bullet point on uh, white product, white waste. What's it called? White, white waste planning. White waste planning, and uh, and so we've already been uh, working with uh, CN Rail to look at different ways to to move that white waste out because we understand fully that that's an issue, and and uh, these guys are completely on that. We'll leave it there for today. Thanks, everyone.